Uh, that's a downside uh, to people who don't get prepared. Uh, this explains all the email feeling. Ah, oh, I had a, you know. Okay, not, not, not makes sense. Sorry, I'll turn this off. All right. Um, you should have all gotten your exams. Um, I grade them as quickly as I could. And uh, uh, the meetings start on Saturday morning, bright and early. Uh, I'm basically here on Saturday from 8 a.m. till uh, questions. I'll talk about the exam on your one-on-ones, but any general questions? No. Okay. Yeah. So in the past, you numbering 10. You get you have 10 points for. Did you note that anywhere? I'll tell it to you during the meeting. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I um, take a uh, five questions, let's get 10. I will give you your individualized scores during the meetings. Um, the reason why I don't do it in advance is the numbers won't make sense to you unless you know what your colleagues get. Uh, so the number in the abstract is actually somewhat unhelpful, but I will give it to you when we meet one-on-one. Uh, uh, -on -one. Um, please, in advance of your meetings, read the memo I sent around. Um, I put a little couple page memo. Um, also, review the A plus answer. And what I want you to do is compare yours to the A plus. Now, the A plus isn't perfect, right? No one got a 50. I think the A plus was a 44 to 50, so still lost six points total. Um, but please review it. See where you're similar, see where you're different. Um, the primary thing that I like to discuss during the meetings is uh, uh, not so much, you know, did you know the answer to number two or number three, right? We can do that fairly quickly. What I am more concerned with is how you're preparing, um, how you're actually taking the exam with timing. Um, I can help you with a lot of things. Some things I can't help you. I can't drill knowledge into your head, right? I'm not, I don't have that power. Um, I can't make you learn this stuff now in three or four weeks till the exam. I, I don't have that power. What I can do is discuss how you're preparing and offer some comments on what is working, maybe what's not. Um, again, I can't make you do stuff. I'm not able to, and I wouldn't want to. I think that's a power far too grand for a person. But I want to show you, perhaps, ways that you can improve. All right? So any questions on that? Uh, don't miss your slot, um, because if you do, you'll have to go to the, at the end of the line. Um, one other note, if you come and you're not prepared, I'll say come back later. So don't, don't blow it, right? Don't just say, yeah, whatever. Uh, bring your paper, right? If you don't have your exam, it makes it a little bit harder to go over it. I can get it, but it's a, annoying. So just bring your paper with you and be ready to discuss it, okay? All right. Um, I want to schedule a review session for the final exam. And your exam, I think, is on the 7th. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, the 7th. And your property exam is on the third. Am I right about that? I think because I teach in that class also. So I'd like to schedule a review session on the fourth. Um, time to be determined, but probably sometime in the afternoon or the early evening. Um, are there any like exams or any obvious reasons why that's a bad date? I realize only half of you are here. Um, but I mean, like, I was like, there's no exam or any sort of anything. All right, I'll ask again, if you remind me, I'll ask again in class on Tuesday, but I'll probably pick that date. Um, that will also be the cutoff for questions. So uh, any questions you get to me in advance of that, I can answer. Um, I will sit here as long as you need. That will go to my office and answer questions after. So after that, you guys are on your own. I found that the marginal utility of questions in the day before the exam is very low, and usually questions born out of panic and not any sort of reason. So I don't like answering those. So I will give you this cutoff, and you can have your you know, time. And I will stay here as late on Friday as you need me to be here. I will not go anywhere. OK? Yeah, yeah. Do you have a final exam review session scheduled already? I know. I have to, I have to change that date. That okay. date's not going to work for so, me either. So we won't do that one. No, yeah. It'll be this one. But yeah, various, yeah I scheduled that date, and now it's not going to work. I think this one's actually a better, because it's not. Um, it's like right before your exam can, can close it in. Yeah, I, property, I have less stuff to teach. There's just less stuff. So I can actually do a review session in class. I can't do it here. If I, don't, if I do it here, you don't do the First Amendment. It's, it's, it's awful, so I have to make a choice. But I appreciate that, Evan, yeah. All right, anything else? All right, let's do this question for you guys to start off with. And, uh, and, and uh, far more than the yes or no is going to be the why. 
So be ready to answer the why. Okay, so the, here's the question, right? Men are required to register for the draft. Women are not. Does this regime violate the equal protection clause? True or false? I'm sorry, yes or no. And again, assume that the protection clause applies to the federal government. Don't, don't give me that. That's not, 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 not for this question. Give it to me somewhere else, maybe. You're all done. There's very few of you here today. Is this the final memo, the final, final memo, or? I think all of law school missed two classes. And that was one for a clerkship interview. Uh, I don't get missing class. Um, all right. This is going to be unfair, but whoever's next, I'll be more lean than average. Lauren, are you next? Oh, sorry, Lean finished last week. Okay. Uh, so before you give me your yes or no answer here, right? How do you go about answering this question? What 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 should you be thinking in your head when I ask you, does X violate the Equal Protection Clause? Um, Good. Okay, so what so the, what's the first question we ask ourselves, right? Tell us. We ask ourselves, um, what type of classification? Very good. Right? So remember we have three kinds of classifications. You have your suspect classification, you have your what's called quasi suspect classification. And you have what's called the non-suspect classification. So, Lauren, where does where does this fact pattern fit into those three categories? Very good. How do you know that? Because they're between Very good. So we learned last week that race is a suspect classification. We learned that gender is a quasi-suspect classification, and we learned that everything else. <laughs> is non-suspect. So, okay, very good. So, Stephanie, we know this is a um, quasi-suspect classification. What's our next uh, our next line of thought? What do we do next? Um, so, once we know what our classification is, what do we do next? Apply the correct level of scrutiny. Okay, good. So, what is our level of scrutiny here? Very good, okay. And what does intermediate scrutiny ask? You have to memorize these, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't tell you to memorize them often, but these, unfortunately, you're gonna have to memorize. Uh, Just read for your notes, it's okay. Oh, good. I don't know. Donnie, what, what's the test here? Um, the government policy is important government interest. Very good, thank you, Donnie. So we ask ourselves, I might have phrased it a little bit differently, but this is, I think, close enough. You'll see in the, uh, in the Craig B. Bourne and Frontier, they phrase it a little bit differently also, which drives students nuts, which is why. Just go with something like this. So we ask, of, is the government policy substantially related to serve an important government interest, right? Now, saying that doesn't tell you a damn thing, right? It's one of these Justice Brennan tests that doesn't really do anything. But there's some, um, there's some, Aspects is which you can assess, right? Uh, I think Jake, you're next. Jake, so first off, what is our end, right? What is the goal that the government's trying to achieve here? Why is the government doing this? Allowing, I'm sorry, requiring men to register, but exempting women. Why, why do they have this policy? My, my email you last night. Oh. Okay, I forgot. Okay, Ryan. Um, I don't know. I guess it'd be to have a fit armed services, and I guess to determine that women aren't fit to fight on the front line. Okay, so so you jump to the the means, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the first end you said is they want to have a fit armed services. Just be a little bit more precise. What do you mean by that? Um, I guess just able to protect or do whatever. Okay. So the government's interest here is to have a uh, capable fighting force, right? However you want to define it. A, uh, a military that's able to respond to threats and war and all this other stuff, right? Now, Jonathan, what's the means that they use to get there? A really crappy law. 
Oh, well, okay. before we give you adjectives, right? Just just describe it, and you can tell me why it's crappy. What why? Yeah. So, well, no, no, no. Don't tell me the why. What what is their means? Then we can say why why it's bad. What is their means of doing it? Yeah. I think it's based off the same crud that we had in the 18th, 19th century, that whole idea that well, women aren't capable of doing all this. Well, so. You're giving me the answer to my second question. First, what is the means? What, what, what is their approach? What is the law at issue? Through legislation to say that all men have to register to protect the country, but women are excluded. That's yes. OK. I'll come back to you in 30 seconds, OK? Because I have a page that I want to ask you about. <laughs> I'm coming back to you in 30 seconds, I promise, right? So Jonathan's correct, right? The means that they say to accomplish that fit, strong fighting force is a requirement of selective service that men have to register, but women are exempt. Now, tell us why that's crud, I think, to use your, your word. Why? Yeah, tell I'm me. I'm a hardcore feminist, and I've been, I've been active with feminist regimes since, like, the 90s. And when I read on page 113 that they had a chance to have an amendment passed, but they didn't want to be drafted, my first thought was, you want equal protection, but you don't want to protect equally. Are you yeah. talking about the Equal Rights yeah. Amendment? Yeah. It just infuriates me because it's no longer relevant. It's that whole idea from the 19th century that women are this thing when we're not even fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat anymore. There's drones, and, and if I'm being frankly honest, if I have to go kill somebody in a foreign country, bake me an apple pie and embroider my shirt. I want to look great when I do it. There's something they can do <laughs> that doesn't always necessitate killing somebody. Okay. Uh, Brian? Okay. <laughs> So, so, so Brian makes a point. He says that at least at the time this regime was created, that women were not eligible for combat duties. Therefore, it would make no sense to have them draft into roles they can't fill. And then I think John says, but to let them do other things that are not combat duties. Now, but correct me if I'm wrong, that's changed, right? Now women can serve combat in certain capacities. Is that right? I think, yeah, I think someone said yes. 2011. Yeah, recently, in the last couple of years. So now my question, which is why I posed the question today in 2017, there was a case on this called Ross Kirby Goldberg in the 80s, where it went the other way, right? Um, Clinton, let me ask you this question, please. Let's assume that now today it's the case that men and women can both be drafted into combat. I'm sorry, they both can serve in combat <laughs> voluntarily, right? If a woman wants to sign up for combat, she can do it. Does this regime then violate the protection clause? In other words, is the sex segregated graft, the graft, is a sex segregated draft substantially related to serving that interest of a ready force. Yes. Okay, why do you say yes? Well, they are able to get the military that they need with this, with this law in place. Uh, I used to address Jonathan's point. Yeah, it excludes 50% of the, the per se, it's 50% of the people on, on uh, in the United States. That's irrelevant. They're still able to get what they need. They're, it is related enough that they can get Ah, so you say they get what they need, but wouldn't it be easier to perhaps draft fewer men and fewer women that way as a, as a, as a whole, you don't have as many men drafted, that way that men have a less likely chance to be drafted? Wouldn't that be perhaps a, a more narrowly tailored policy? It would be more narrowly tailored, but we're not at that level. We're at the... Oh, so Clint is, Clint is drawing a difference from what you might require in strict scrutiny and intermediate scrutiny, right? You're saying strict scrutiny... Is this narrowly tailored, right? Is this the, the best way of accomplishing national readiness? He's saying, well, it might not be the best way, but it's a good enough way. Now, Evan, let me ask you one more question. Why do you think historically women were excluded from combat duty? Because uh, it was viewed that they didn't have the same physical capabilities as men. Right, and, and this is what was called stereotyping, right, in, the, uh, in Justice Brennan's opinions in Reed and, and uh, Frontiero, right? Is relying on a stereotype a sufficient governmental basis to act. No. Ah. So 
I raised this hypothetical. It actually came up uh, during the last election. A number of the candidates mentioned this at debates. Assuming women are now eligible for combat duty, which they are now, does the government still have a good enough reason to exclude women from the draft? Is the exclusion based on readiness, or is it based on a perhaps stereotype, as Justice Brennan would say, that they're physically incapable of fighting? And if that stereotype is uh, perhaps not completely accurate, can this policy then be supported? Um, this issue might actually change in the, I don't know, the next four to eight years, but it, at some point I think it, it might change. Yes, sir. I just want to say that women, they were not allowed to fight in they were also at home doing a host of duties that can be like doing like supporting the water. So, so I don't think it was just there, but it was also a, like a, ho a, ho a host of things to do in the country. Yeah. Rosie the Riveter, right? Uh, I guess along those lines. Of, you know, taking care of the family. And, but I can do that too, so. Okay. All right, so uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer for this one, actually. I, th I think I'm not. Whoa, that's pretty damn close. Wow, that's right down the middle. Look at that. Right down the middle. Um, yeah, I don't have an answer. I, I, I think under Justice Ginsburg's test in the, oh, second wit, I think under Justice Ginsburg's opinion in the Virginia case, um, it's hard to support such a policy. But the flip side is the military does usually get some um, deference in terms of their uh, structuring. So I, I, I can go back and forth on this one. Um, uh, who had a hand? Yeah, wait, go ahead. I remember in the cases yesterday, it talked about under strict scrutiny if they could apply a racially neutral test that would get the same result they should. Mm -hmm. Does that apply to like all of the classes? That's that's Clint's argument, right? That's what Clinton's argument. That there might be a gender neutral reason why they adopted this policy that's not based on stereotyping. Right. I just meant like. It seemed like they were applying that under strict scrutiny, but would you also apply yeah, that to the other Yeah, you could apply that sort of neutral approach to this level even greater, right? Um, yeah, so th this issue does come up. Yeah, I, I go back and forth. I think this, this might be a close call. Um, uh, Trey and then Clinton? So is the right being protected? So if, people, if this, the law is saying that companies and citizens have equal protection, the right being protected is the right to be drafted. So, so let's talk about language for a minute, right? No one ever talks about language. The clause is not the equal application clause, right? It doesn't say the law has to be applied equally. It says equal protection law. What are people being protected from? No, no, not the draft, the Klan. Um, <laughs> I, I think if you go back to how the framers understood the phrase equal protection, it was that the state has to protect people from segregation and discrimination. Much of our modern 14th Amendment case law is entirely divorced from anything in the 14th Amendment's history. But as it's been interpreted, right, as it's been interpreted, Trey, um, this isn't about whether the government has the power to draft. But if they do have a draft, must it be applied equally to men and women alike? Clinton? Let me go back to the on why how this could be found to violate the equal protection. I don't understand how it could even be found because it, it, based on the test, the government policy is substantially related to serve the important government interest. It is substantially related. Is it? What would Justice Ginsburg say in Virginia? So here's, I mean, I'm skipping ahead of it, but I want to answer Clinton's question fairly. If you read Justice Scalia's dissent in Virginia, Right? He basically says that the court's applying strict scrutiny. So even if, Clint, you're right with the um, classical recitation of the test, as it's been interpreted by Ginsburg in Virginia, I don't know if it's that permissive. This is why students hate scrutiny, because they give you all these very good rules, and then the court proceeds to ignore them one after the other. And depending who's in the majority in a given case, they basically apply strict scrutiny or they don't. Um, it, it's maddening. Yeah, Lord. For intermediate scrutiny, um, do courts give deference to like the alternative, um, like alternative means that they can, uh, you know, meet or fit the ends? Or... Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're supposed to consider alternative approaches. But what you're going to learn, and what you're going to see in the next few days, next few classes, is these tests aren't applied with any consistency. 
it's it's almost it's almost like a joke, right? Justice Brennan tried going strict scrutiny, didn't have the votes. All right, we'll do intermediate, whatever. <laughs> and then Ginsburg later basically called it intermediate, but applied strict. Yeah, Laura and then Clint. Well, then would it be um, like constitutional if government say you know there's no if the government said there's no other means, by which that, that would, I think, that would, I think make, make a difference. But for example, in the BMI case, the government said, well, we have this alternate, this women's college, right? And the giver said, no, no, it's, it's different. It's not the same. So even if they say there's an, an alternate means of doing it. Perhaps. Clinton and then uh, Sam. So I think the BMI case, the reason it's not applicable to this, the BMI case, there was a one class the females were being fairly in that because they treated unfairly here no they're not being treated unfairly why 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 not because in this case they are not being subjected to the draft. doesn't that treat them as second class citizens by saying they're not worthy of being drafted see what clint's saying is this is great for women right they don't have to go to war and die yeah. right this is awesome yeah. my point is different there's one saying you're, you're treating with a second class citizen by not making me eligible for this. Um, yeah, Sam, and then, then Evan? Yeah, I'm just going to give the flip side of the question. Yeah, 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 Sam? That was kind of my question is who would challenge the women? Law of well, actually, to, to be frank, actually be a guy saying that it's unfair that I'm being drafted and my sister's not. <laughs> There's a case, and what if women yeah. Are fine with that? What's that? And what if women are fine with that? You know? Sucks for them. Equality is a bitch. No, it's not the, right. <laughs> ah, damn it. Uh, well, unfortunately, no one's here. But, but, but let, let me go back to Jonathan's point before. The Equal Rights Amendment, right? This is referenced before. One of the reasons why women didn't want this amendment at the time was because they didn't want to be drafted. So there actually was a desire to have to have this non-equality. But unfortunately, this is, um, this is the point. Uh, if you guys say this in property, you, you've done um, marital property yet? And Tennessee by the entirety? So there's some regimes that when women were no longer under what's called co remember coverture? Yeah. So when women were no longer under coverture, that meant that they could be incurring debts on their own and that their product could be seized. And one of the aspects of giving women property rights is that now their product could be taken away from them. And there's actually some cost to that. And there's debate saying, well, do we give women the right to property? Can they lose their money? So sometimes with equality comes various costs. Evan and then Stephanie? Yeah, my point was exactly like Sammy's. It's, uh... It would be the men that are the ones. They would bring the suit. Exactly. They're the ones being treated unfairly because they're. Yep. More, the, here it is. The men are more likely to get drafted because women are not in the pool. Right? If there were another 100 million women in the pool, the likelihood of drafting for a guy would go down. I think that's the argument. Um, I was going to say, I agree with what you said that equality is a bitch. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have no, said that. I, 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 it's true, though. I, I, I agree that, you know, I, I think that Good, good, yeah. And, the uh, same benefits and same burdens. I think that's a good way of putting it. Good. And um, I, I, mean, I, I think there's no doubt, but if, there, if that's not an option, I think women should be included. Because, I mean, yeah, there's a chance you go out to war and die, but it's also depriving them of opportunities of equal pay. And good, 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 yeah. Because there's no, there's no difference between a, the pay of like a female sergeant or a male sergeant. And I think it would help broaden and expectations about what women do, just in general. Yeah, and I like the way Stephanie phrased that, right? She said that the benefits and the burdens exist, right? You take the good with the bad. So if you want all the benefits of equality, you got to take the burdens. Uh, when you do marital property, you'll see what I'm talking about. This comes up very, uh, very strongly. Uh, Clinton, anyone else before Clinton? Oh, uh, no. Yeah, Gabriel. Oh, I'm sorry, Kevin. Oh, I'm not saying you go first. Yeah, you go first. Oh, you okay. go first. Um, well, I was going to say, since... Uh, the draft is, I mean, this is a predominantly a, a defense issue. Mm. Uh, does the Department of Defense, uh, does, do their uh, data and information carry more weight than, let's say, like, some senator politicking? DOD just did this where they admitted, like, I think, like, 30 uh, women into, like, Marine training uh, uh, boot camp type thing, and I don't think any of them were able to pass. Um, and they were using that as kind of, like, Guiding principles to well, let, yeah, let's say Kevin's right. Like, I, I don't know the facts, what he said. Let's just assume the facts are this, right? Let's assume that there was a trial for Marine Corps and the, the flunk rate failure was 100% for women cadets. This goes to the VMI case. Do the standards have to be modified? Maybe the test is not accurate. 
or perhaps their modified combat duties, right? And if that's the case, what if someone is not fully prepared to engage in the duties? This comes up with departments, right? With tests for fire departments. Um, if any of you, I don't think I have any, but anyone who's a fire uh, a fighter, they're required a certain number of physical tests. We have to put a pack of a certain number of pounds in their back, run up a, you know, however many stairs, pick up a, a weight of a certain size, and um, the failure rate for women are significantly higher. So is the answer then to lower the test or just exclude them? Yeah, Gabriel? So, JT says in the statement about the women for the tax test. So, let's say that they have to lower the performance for them to pass. But those, that goes against the institution. Like, the whole point of the institution is to make people stronger and to break them down. And if they lower the test, then that goes against their whole principle. And I feel like um, it's, it's not that it will show them that they're weak, but it kind of that'll take the whole purpose of why people go into that. Yeah. I think Whit and then Brian. <laughs> I, think, I don't know, I just, I find it interesting that we are saying we're lowering the test and when in reality, the warfare is changing and if we're mm. expected to keep the same test, uh, I mean, to pull out a, a quote from Einstein, if you have a test for climbing a tree to see who's the best and you put a goldfish and try to climb the tree, it's not gonna, go very well, but I don't think that if you can expect a woman to pass the same test if it's carrying 50 pounds of weight, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to not be the best soldier uh, in an era where, I guess, information is even more deadly than mm -hmm. being able to shoot or carry 50 pounds. Yeah, I think Jonathan mentioned drones, so I mentioned it earlier. Uh, uh, Brian, and then Javier. The range of what program? Oh, that's what I thought you said. Indoctrination, okay. These four women have taken the test multiple times, and they all failed until they all passed. And when people started looking into what happened, like what changed, they realized that every time they took the test, they lowered the standard for the, the physical fitness aspect of what they had to do. And what people don't understand is, is when you join the military, everybody is set to the same standard. Like every 29-year-old male has to do the exact same thing as every other 29-year-old male. Same thing as females and, and all the other services. So if you continuously lower the standard, that means that every other person in your category has to meet that exact same standard. Like it doesn't matter if you're So I'm 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 less concerned for this discussion. Um, I'm less concerned about discussion than the than the broader question of how will courts review it, right? Um, because this all raises the same question: Who gets to decide the fit, the military or the courts, right? Let's say the generals come in and say we need a certain standard and women can't fit it, and the courts say we think you're basing this on outdated stereotypes, right? Under intermediate scrutiny, can the courts override the judgment of the military, right? And that leads me, if I may, into our first case of the day, which is Frontiero versus Richardson. Um, one thing to know about these cases is that they were all litigated in a fairly uh, a short period of time, the early 1970s. Um, you had the case called Reed versus Reed, you had a case called Frontiero versus Richardson, and they had a case called Craig v. Bourne. They were all decided one after the other. And they were all orchestrated by, um, I'm going to picture it, uh, Justice Ginsburg, here she is today, uh, who was the head of the American Civil Liberties Union Women's Project, the Women's Law Project. And she argued several of these cases uh, 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 successfully. 
And Ginsburg's strategy w w was very smart, and she did something very different, right? At the time, you had nine male justices, and the fear was if we brought into cases saying, you're treating women unfair, right? The justices might not have been, uh, say, sympathetic to those claims. So instead, Ginsburg approached it differently. Instead of bringing cases where women were treated unfairly, they brought in cases where men were being treated unfairly, right? And the hope was, and I think it for the most part succeeded, was that the judges will be more receptive to a challenge where a man is being discriminated against. So in Frontiero, right, you had a, you had a husband who was being denied certain sp uh, spousal benefits for being on the base, right? In Craig against Boren, you had a law where women could buy beer at 16, I'm sorry, at 18, and then men, at, men could buy it at an older age, right? So that was a deliberate strategy. And the strategy, I think, was pretty successful. So let's walk through these cases, Frontiero and Craig, and we'll do them more or less together. I think they're the same issue. OK. Uh, oh, who's up? I, uh, all right, Jeffrey, you want to give me the facts, please, in Frontiero? So Sharon Frontiero was a member of the Air Force, and she lived on base with her husband and decided to thank him as an attendant to get better quarters and benefits. Good. And there's a statute saying she had to prove she was over half of his, like he was a fan of her over half. Very good. And for men, there's no requirement. They get it automatically. Okay, very good. So we understand the regime here, right? The traditional norm was that if you were a man with a wife on the base, the wife was considered a homemaker. And she was entitled to certain benefits. She got an extra allowance, et cetera, et cetera. But starting in the 1960s or 70s, I don't know exactly when, women were admitted as officers of the military. Do you know the exact year, Brian? 60s or 70s, right, ballpark? What year? I think it was 65. That, that sounds reasonable, right? So in the 60s, whenever, mid-60s, late 60s, women were now admitted as officers. And now women could have spouses. So you actually had Sharon, who was the, the wife, was lieutenant in the Air Force. And you had her husband, Joseph, who was a dependent. Um, he worked part-time, he went to school, he did various things, but he was not the primary income earner. The lieutenant's salary was probably higher than whatever he was making. Okay? But the law was like this. If the wife was applying for benefits, she got them basically automatically. right? But if the husband was seeking to apply for these benefits, he would have to persuade them that he was not the primary earner, that he was actually dependent on this money. So here we have a case where the benefit was given automatically to women. But to use Stephanie's phrase, the burden here was assigned to the husband, that he had to make this additional showing that he needed the money. And he didn't. He didn't. He actually was um, uh, uh, earning some outside income, so he probably wouldn't have been eligible. So they challenged us saying this was a violation of the protection of the law. Okay, we understand the facts, right? Now, I kind of sneaked ahead last class when I discussed this intermediate quasi you know, this stuff. That didn't exist in the 70s. At the time, if you had a racial classification, you were in strict scrutiny land. For everything else, you were put in the rational basis standard of review. And with a rational basis review, uh, Abdul, with this law, right, that uh, women have to get automatically, but men have to you know, satisfy a rational basis standard review. Uh, no. Rational basis. Rational. Oh, okay. Well, what's the you test for rational basis? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, Abdul, what's the test for rational basis, please? Uh, like, it, good. Okay. Yeah, use my words. Very good. Right. So. Abdul, what's the what's like the good reason why, or what's like the rationale why the government would need this policy, right? Why? Um, so, okay, so when the way Ben put it is that it's, um, it's just administrative efficiency. Good, money. good, good, good. Administrative efficiency. Just just explain that a little bit more, please, Abdul. <coughs> they assume that like they're stereotyping basically. No, no, no. Oh. Stereotyping is different. Let's just why as a matter of administrative. Makes it efficient, right? It's quicker just to say, well, men are. No, no, no. Okay, I thought. No, 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 no. Um, uh, is it uh, them? Yes. Why? What's the administrative reason why the government has this? Putting aside sexism and stereotypes, we'll get there in a minute, right? Why does the government have this regime? 
What's like uh, the, 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 if you were the government lawyer, right, why would you argue we have this? You're not going to say, you know, because we think women are dependent and they're, they're homemakers and, you know, they're, they're, they're. What's the answer you give as, as a government lawyer here? As a government lawyer, um, I think you want to. So as a government, you want the benefits to be distributed. Uh, in this case, mm -hmm. they don't want the man to be the the, uh, the burden of of relying on a woman to to get the benefits. Well, well, well if it's the other way around, then it's okay. Well, well now let me ask you a simple question, right? Um, at the time. What percentage of the people applying for these benefits were men, and what percentage do you think were women? Okay, let's just guess. The percentage of women apply, I guess, it was pretty high. Yeah, I and think it's probably close to 100%, right? Right. And then how many of the spouses applying for this were men? Um, very low. Okay. I mean, you know, maybe almost to zero. Well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably a very small number. So the government can say this. Look, this is for administrative efficiency. This is Abdul's point a minute ago, right? We think that... Lots of women applying. We don't need to scrutinize those carefully. But with men, we need to scrutinize it carefully because there's a risk of fraud. Oh. See, Abdul is getting there two questions. I'll come back to you, I promise. Right? The government said, look, when women are applying it, we're not really worried, right? Because stereotypically, women are homemakers. And they're, there you go. Now, you were, you were really close, right? And stereotypically, they're expected to stay home, so we're not surprised when, when a woman applies for this sort of dependent uh, uh, um, stipend. In contrast, when a man applies for it, whoa, we're suspicious, right? They're trying to double dip, right? They're trying to engage in fraud. Since it's very likely the husband also works, we shouldn't have to give him a second salary. <clears throat> so the entire regime, the government lawyer will say, is based on government efficiency, right? Where are we directing our resources? We want to focus on the highest cases of fraud, so we're not paying out additional money. And where is it likely to be fraud? With the husbands, because they're likely to have outside income, and they're less likely to actually need this, this, this government funding. Right? So you have this general stereotype, and built on top of the stereotype, argument based on efficiency. Um, I'll pause briefly. It's not that dissimilar from the draft question, right? You have a stereotype that perhaps women are more frail and they're less strong. Therefore, they should be excluded from the draft. It's all about the efficiency of the force. All right, so McKinney, what then does Justice Brennan do with this classification, with this, with this, with this law? You mean in terms of scrutiny? Yeah, tell me. He says it should be held to uh, intermediate scrutiny. Now, what's he saying about strict scrutiny here? He kind of he kind of dances around this issue, you see, right? Yeah, yeah. So a little weird. He kind of says that <laughs> the reason that race is held to strict scrutiny is because of this systematic oppression that's happened in the past. Um, and then he specifically he points out the right to vote, where he says that uh, African American men got the right to vote in the franchise before women did. And so he's kind of saying, well, maybe we actually should be holding this to a higher level of scrutiny. But but why doesn't he? I can't Yvonne, why does he go strict scrutiny here? There's a really easy reason. Why does Brennan not get strict scrutiny here? There's a very simple reason. Oh. Hold, I'm going to give you the answer right five. What's five? Six. What's five? What's five? Seven, no, fifth amendment. High five? No? <laughs> I'll come back to Yvonne. Five. You know what I'm saying? Five? Right, is it the fifth no, no, not fifth amendment. Five. What's five? What am I doing with my hand here? Because only five, very few have survived it. No, 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 no. Five votes. Thank you, Laura. Yes, and Yvonne. Oh, you got it. Okay, but Laura, Yvonne, get credit. Very good. Five <laughs> votes. Justice Brennan, he was very famous. When his law clerks came in at the start of the term, he would go to his clerks and say, what's the most important number around here? And he'd hold up his hand. Five. Because with five votes, you can do anything. He didn't have the votes. Did not have the votes. In Reed versus Reed, I think he had four votes for strict scrutiny. He could not get five colleagues to agree that women were, I'm sorry, gender was a suspect classification. He could not get five votes to agree that uh, sex-based classifications were given strict scrutiny. He just couldn't get the votes. 
and he knew it. So Brennan, who was very influential for his time, said, all right, screw it. We'll just call it intermediate scrutiny, right? We'll make up this new tier, which didn't really exist before. Middle tier, and we'll make up this new test. And under this new test, the government still loses. So even though it's not strict, right, which means that there might be some cases where a race classification would be struck down, but a gender classification would be upheld, right? There are some cases. However, we have this new level. I'll give you an easy example, right, for Brennan. One set of bathrooms for African Americans, one set of bathrooms for non-African Americans. Would that be unconstitutional? No. That's a suspect classification. I think it'll be struck down. Aha. One set of bathroom for men and one set of bathroom for women. Would that be okay? So see, there's a difference. Knowledge is that there might be some differences why men and women should be treated differently, but here the government does not have an adequate justification. Laura and Ivana are correct. He did not have five. He didn't have his five fingers, right? Brennan was very famous. So the opinion here says, okay, well, we can't do strict scrutiny because we don't have the votes, but I got the votes for this new thing. And we're going to call it intermediate scrutiny. And we'll call this a quasi-suspect classification. And given a quasi-suspect classification, we have this new test. And again, he doesn't frame it exactly like he gets to that. And I, I encourage you to use this phrasing because it's, it's a little bit easier to understand. Instead of requiring narrow tailoring, we require a substantial relationship. And instead of being compelling, we inquire to be important. Similar, not different, not exactly the same, but very similar. Okay, so I'm gonna get this is where this is basically where it comes from, this new test. This is this intermediate scrutiny test, which will annoy law students to no end. Okay, so any questions on that so Yes, Laura, go ahead. So then before this case, um, I guess we only had rational basis and uh, strict scrutiny. Yes, ma'am. So um, unfortunately, law professors played a role in this. We're very evil people, right? So for, law, for, for decades, lawyers were like, wait a minute. If it's race, it gets a super, you know, magnet, a super microscope. But if it's gender, it gets you know, nothing at all. So there had been a long time movement. And, and just then, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was trying to push for this. So Brennan's opinion here was a long time coming. right? They, they were building up to this. Um, because I think, I think Yvonne, or maybe it was McKinney, mentioned this a minute ago. Uh, the oppression that perhaps was faced by African Americans was maybe on par with women, maybe not. You, you can argue one or the other. It was different than age, right? Right. It was different than saying 16-year-olds get their driver's license in one state and 18-year-olds get their license in the other state. There, there's a difference between sex segregation. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. You should have asked that the first class. What's the point? Why are we here? Uh, God, what a good question. It's a very good question, Raquel. Uh, what's the point? Um, let me answer your question a little bit more simply. I don't think the Supreme Court applies them consistently. The lower courts apply them more consistently. And 99.9% .9 of civil rights cases are not resolved by the US Supreme Court. They're resolved by the lower court. So to the extent that you have a judge in a federal district court, He's or she's probably going to try to uh, adhere to this, but when it gets upstairs, they do whatever they want. Um, in particular, Justice Kennedy, you haven't gotten to Kennedy yet. You'll see very quickly care about Kennedy. It doesn't factor into his opinion at all. It doesn't mention it. it. Doesn't really care about it. Like he, he just doesn't really care about it. Sorry. But it was very important in the '70s, right? In the '70s, for about a good 10-year period, this stuff really mattered. For it was a good 10-year stretch, but not so much in the '80s and '90s. I have uh, two questions. So they, they argued this case under the due process clause, right? Well, yeah, it's a Fifth Amendment because it's against the federal government. It's a Fifth Amendment case with under Bowling versus Sharp. There's this reverse incorporation doctrine where the federal government's bound by protection. Okay. That's why when I sit upstairs, don't tell me that's a Fifth Amendment and the uh, question will be let off that. Gotcha. But you're right. You're and, right. And then the second one was um, it's just a procedural thing. So you can submit an amicus brief to the Supreme Court. And then they ask you to argue. So it, was, it said at the beginning of the case that Ginsburg argued the amicus curiae brief or whatever. So, so amicus, right? Let me, let me write this word if you haven't seen it. Amicus curiae. People pronounce it 15 different ways. 
say it however you want, but I say amicus curiae or amicus curiae. That means friend of the court, like amigo, right, friend. It, it's Latin for friend of the court. Um, in any given case, file a brief. I do this all the time, file lots of amicus briefs. And we try to um, apprise the court of some information that they might not otherwise be um, uh, aware of, right? Um, occasionally, rarely, but occasionally, the court lets an amicus argue in front of the court. This happened this year, I think, maybe once or twice. Uh, it's very rare, but that does happen sometimes. And usually that happens when the party wants a different perspective. When the party wants a different perspective. Is this before the trial starts? Well, this is at the U.S. Supreme Court at the very end. Oh, at the very end. Yeah, I mean, you can have amicus argue in a district court. I, I've tried. I re my requests have been denied so far, but I've tried to get it. But is it before each side gives their argument? So the way the briefing schedule works is the petitioner goes first, and a week after the petitioner's brief is filed, Amiki filed a brief. And about a month later, the respondent files their brief, and Amiki supporting the respondent filed their brief. So everyone has their shot. Most Amiki's briefs are never read. They're ignored. We file them anyway. They're, they're, they're fun. I'm sorry? You have to be a member of the bar? No, no, no. A member of the Supreme Court bar. This is, so the Supreme Court bar, uh, uh, three years after you guys all pass, that you pass the bar, you can apply to a member of the Supreme Court bar. You have to have two members who sponsor your admission. It doesn't cost a few hundred bucks. It's not very expensive. Uh, you also need consent of the parties, right? Because the parties might consent, they might not consent to you following a brief. Uh, no one's opposed to my briefs yet. I think I'll have that very soon. People will post my, my briefs for being filed, uh, or at least the, the government will. But um, uh, uh, if they all consent, then it's fine. If they oppose it, then you have to ask for permission of the court, leave of court, to file the brief. I like to think. Um, uh, lots of people file really bad briefs, so there's no like minimum quality standard. You're supposed to you're supposed to say I have some expertise that the court lacks. Not everyone does. A lot of these briefs are repetitive, they're duplicative, they don't really add much. Sometimes they're good. Occasionally, the court will cite an amicus brief. In fact, you'll see this in your um, readings. You'll see an amicus curia brief of so-and-so, right? Uh, I have not been cited yet. I, it probably happens soon enough. Yeah. I, they've used my stuff without citing it, but I'll, I'll let that one go. <laughs> yeah. That's the worst when they, they use your stuff and they'll cite you. the worst. Yeah, yeah, John. Um, so, is uh, the holding of the case Good, yeah. Let's go back to the actual case. Good. I guess I just wanted to know if that this theory is actually the actual holding of the case is still born, right? Well, 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 look. So what? So, so. All right. Let, let, let's let me wrap up for you um, the Brennan opinion, right? Brennan says that if I don't answer your question, then just come back to me, okay? Brennan explains that this this regime exists based on stereotypes. And they're based on a stereotype that a woman's more likely to be a homemaker than a man who's going to work out in the field, and therefore the policy is not supported. He then also says that sex, like race, is immutable. What's immutable mean? This word, immutable, means you're born with it, right? You can't change it, right? You're born who you are. And Brendan's like, well, then why are we treating gender any differently than race? But I lack the votes, so I'm just going to put this out here. Hope a, re a Democrat wins the White House and gets, gets, me, gets me a fifth vote. Wouldn't happen. After this term, the, the court gets far more conservative, or at least a little more conservative. So you can't give strict scrutiny, so we'll apply this intermediate scrutiny. Okay? And the, the court doesn't really, doesn't, really, doesn't really give a strict answer, right? But in the next case, Craig v. Boren, you get a much, a much more um, developed opinion. So let's go into Craig, right? So in other words, John, you're asking what's a holding in Frontier? Well, they struck down this regime, but they didn't give a solid reason why. But then the next year, or sorry, three years later in Craig, you get the oomph, which is why I teach it back to back. Oh, who am I? April. So give me the facts, please, and Craig be born. Good. Prohibiting 
Good. By the way, it's not all beer, it's light beer. Does everyone know what this is? Does anyone ever have it? Is it gross? So it's not all beer, but it's like this, what is it, 3%, 3.2% beer. And in some states, states have very complicated alcohol laws, but in some states, they sell this beer in like bars and stuff. Anyway, so April, come on, please. Was Craig a guy or a girl? He's a guy. I mean, it's his last name, right? Um, this is a photo showing um, the attorneys involved uh, 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 in the case. This is Curtis Craig. Is his first name, his last name. But Curtis Craig was the uh, plaintiff. And he complains, like, wait a minute, this isn't fair. My sister can go get some beer at 18, and I got to be 21. Okay? It was also brought by the owner. Um, this is Carolyn Whitener who is the owner of, I love this name, the Honk and Holler Grocery. What a, what, a, what, a, what a cool name, the Honk and Holler Grocery. So this suit was brought on behalf not only of a male person who couldn't buy beer, but of a, of a, of a vendor, a store, who said, it violates my constitutional rights that I can't sell this beer to guys at 18. Um, questionable if that, if that was a proper standing, but uh, I'll leave that, leave that aside for now. All right? So Carlos, what happened here? Uh, well, obviously, uh, the owner of the store is going to take a complaint with violating the constitutional rights, specifically that uh, uh, President and I said it's so hard for us to uh, individuals of the same age, but it was because it was solely based on, on gender. The thing is, uh, the court uh, was uh, argumentating that, according to the statistics, Males of that age range were way more uh, likely to cause uh, an accident uh, uh, by drunk driving than females. Okay. That was their argument. Okay, very good. So here's the issue, right? Uh, Danielle, right? So you're a government lawyer, right? You go to court and you want to defend Oklahoma's policy. What's your argument? Brian, you're a government lawyer. You go to court. What's your argument? Uh, show the statistics that um, support the legislation that was passed. Like these are these are the traffic accidents and um, so on and so forth that have occurred, and these are the, the age groups and genders of the people getting into those accidents and the levels of intoxication. Okay. April, are you raising your hand? Sorry, I was just saying. Yeah, yeah, very good. I think you're both, you're both on target, right? You're a government lawyer, right? And you have this Oklahoma law. You want to defend it. You say, look, we have statistics showing that women at this age are better drivers than men at the same age. And I think if you actually looked at insurance rates, maybe you have uh, uh, teenage brothers and sisters, you know this, uh, insuring a teenage girl is usually cheaper than insuring a teenage guy. This is actuarials, right? Now, does that get you far enough, though, right? That's about alcohol safety. I'm sorry, that's about road safety. So, Regina, what then is the fit, right? What's the connection between limiting the sale of alcohol and highway safety, right? Your end is highway safety, and your means is restricting the sale of alcohol. What's the fit? between those two items? Oh, why is it not really a fit? Tell me. Very good. Let me ask you a question. One more, Regina, just to finish it up. Does this law prohibit drinking, an 18-year-old drinking beer, or just purchasing it? So does anything stop someone else from buying beer for a guy and handing it over to him? Ah. And this is a point, Jonathan, you can't? Isn't it kind of like Dole v. Dakota? Like, doesn't this also deprive people who aren't even driving of a right to purchase? Very good, them? yeah. So they're very similar arguments here. In fact, if you recall, Justice Brennan dissented in South Dakota v. Dole. Might not have been your book. He did. And he also wrote the majority opinion here. He was thinking of this case when he got to South Dakota v. Dole. Very, very good connection, right? So I think Regina and Jonathan raised two points that are important. Okay? This law doesn't actually prohibit drinking and driving. What it prohibits is the sale of alcohol, 
right? If the government was uh, uh, interested in preventing drinking and driving, John, what other kind of law could they pass? Right? What, what would be a better law to pass than this sort of, um, uh, than this sort of sales regime? What, what could they pass that would be more um, narrowly tailored, shall I say? Yeah, pass a DUI law. It says the punishment for DUI is you lose your car. We have that in certain jurisdictions, right? The punishment for DUI is 20 years in jail. John, which would be more effective at deterring drinking and driving? A 20 year jail sentence for DUI or this law, which says just you can't. Whatever, guys. The first one. I think he's right. But that's the importance of heightened scrutiny, right? If this were subject only to rational basis, the only question is, might this law improve highway safety? Might it? And the answer, I think, is, yeah, it might. But will it improve highway safety? Brennan says, probably not. Right? Probably not. And he does this by scrutinizing very carefully the statistics, right? The government comes forward with all these statistics saying, uh, you know, X percentage of men have these accidents, and Y percentage of women, and I don't have to bore you guys with math, law students hate math, but he says the surveys don't adequately justify the um, salient features of this law. Uh, I'll just pause and briefly note, social science, uh, he's not very interested in it here, even though it plays a big role uh, in other cases. Okay. So when you, oh, sorry, Gabriel, go ahead. So even if we were trying to achieve uh, safety for the highways, both men and others, by drunk, but if these are if these are group of people, the women can just buy the drink and they can just drink it. So they can, and give it to really the guys, yeah. Like, you know, oh, we're not going to drink, so we cannot buy it. Like, yeah, 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 exactly. What Brennan says is this will not improve highway safety. It probably will do nothing to improve highway safety. Yeah, Laura? Yeah, so let's talk about the, the social science stuff for a minute, right? Right, let's talk about the social science for a minute. Um, he basically challenges the validity of these studies on one important fact. He says something like this. If a girl is caught driving drunk, the cop will probably take her home and just not arrest her. If the guy is caught driving drunk, he'll be arrested. So he says the studies themselves are probably not even accurate because they're premised on stereotypes, Right. The idea that if a girl is fun driving, oh, you'll take her home to her father, he'll take care of her, right? Whereas a guy, so he's even saying the studies themselves are probably bunk, right? Well, because it's studying on like, these beliefs, the stereotypes. Exactly. 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 Okay. Yeah. So Brennan puts a very strict level of scrutiny on these data. And he says because they're likely premised on some sort of stereotypes, like Laura mentioned a moment ago, that they're not to be afforded the deference that they're due. Everyone with me so far? I see people about to raise their hands. Wait, or John, is your hand up? You're, you're thinking about it. Uh, so this one, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. This one, not fast, or, I guess I'm trying to look at the trend of I understand he applies social scrutiny, but under no standards would he, even given the statistics. Does this look much different than strict scrutiny to you? It, it doesn't. That's what I mean. Yeah. And I think that's an important point. Even though Brennan doesn't call it strict scrutiny, man, he's parsing social science. He's ripping apart, saying, no, flawed assumptions, negative, you know, he's, he's tearing things apart. This looks a hell of a lot like strict scrutiny. A hell of a lot like strict scrutiny. Go ahead, please. Furthering the agenda. Are you saying Justice Brennan had an agenda? Oh, man, Laura. Oh, God, what have I done to your old bunch of cynics? No, I'm, 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 I'm messing with you. I'm, 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 I'm joking. I'm messing with you. Yeah, I mean, look, Brennan was effective. He was, he was doing his own thing up there, and he was very effective at it. He was very good at it. With, I was just curious. In Brown, we talked about social scientists and adults as 
it seems like, and I don't know, maybe it was just like a redacted version of the, of the opinion, but they didn't really note any actual statistical data in that, but the court still found it convincing and, and persuasive enough to use it as a rationale. But in here, they actually have like statistical basis and yep. you know, numerical representations and things that I, in my mind, you know, are more convincing, I guess, than adult heads. Why would they not accept that, I guess? Was that just because they hadn't had this level of scrutiny back then? Or? So Witt's asking a question, right? Witt asked like this, that in Brown, they relied on basically very generic long-term studies that may or may not have had um, precise application. Here, you have precise statistics, I think it's not enough. This is some sort of uber strict scrutiny, right? That they're applying it very rigidly. Okay, let me move on. One thing about Justice Brennan that was very, um, very, uh, uh, devious is the wrong word. He's very crafty, right? He would always bury the lead, so to speak, right? He'd always put the test like almost where you wouldn't expect it. And here, if you don't read to the end of the case, as maybe some of you did, you will miss it. So in the very last paragraph, you have this sentence. I want to just dwell on this for a minute, right? He says, in fact, when it is further recognized that Oklahoma statute prohibits only the selling of 3.2% beer, to young males, and not to their drinking, and not their drinking the beverage once acquired. Parenthesis: even after acquired, per, even after purchased by their 18 to 20 year old female companions, oh, these long sentences. He's lost you the first half, right? But then it comes the important part. He's already lost you. You're already stop paying attention. That says, comma, the relationship between gender and traffic safety, that is the means and the ends, right, becomes far too tenuous to satisfy. Reed's requirement, this was Reed to Reed, that, here's your test, the gender-based difference be substantially related to the achievement of the statutory objective. There's your test, right? Framed a little bit differently, but it's the same thing. That the gender-based difference be substantially related to achievement of the government objective. Remember, I told you this last week. You would not even notice if you were just reading this because you would just gloss right over it. And by the way, Reed never said that. If you notice, there are no quotation marks, right? He's making it up, right? Reed never, Reed was basically a strict scrutiny opinion. So he's, <laughs> this is Brennan. That's why he was who he was. He did this stuff all the time, right? And therefore, we hold that the 3.2% beer discriminates against women, I'm sorry, against males, and violates the protection. But there's your test, right? Bury it at the very end of the opinion, which you, if you read quickly, you would, you would gloss right over it. Is that basically just true? What we mean, germaneness. Means and fit, because he kept saying germane later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. What's so the word tenuous, right? He has this word over here, tenuous, right? What does tenuous mean? Really weak. Right. What's the what's the fit between two different things? The means and the end. That, that's right, Jonathan. Very good. So, everyone, any any more questions about the Brennan majority opinion? Quit. From my understanding, he's basically saying that the goal is to lessen these traffic accidents and the fact that or like underage drinking, and the fact that they're still getting the alcohol is The not... fact that the guys can still drink it means the statute's not precise enough, that there's not sufficient narrow tailoring. That if they were actually serious about driveway safety, highway safety, they would prohibit the drinking of it. But this is based on stereotypes, he says, not an actual governmental policy, it's legitimate. So the statistics are fine, but like the actual yes. fit is not... Bingo, yeah. Thank you. Any questions on Brennan? I want to go ahead to Justice Powell, who has this footnote, right? And let me just read to you briefly. He says, uh, it's evident that the court has had difficulty in agreeing on a standard equal protection analysis, right? And this is Laura's comment a minute ago, right? There are valid reasons for dissatisfaction with the two-tier approach that has been prominent in the court's decisions. Although viewed by many as a result-oriented substitute for more critical analysis, that approach with its limited... Uh, narrowly limited upper tier, now a substantial presidential support. As has been true of Reed and his progeny, our decision today will be viewed by some as a middle tier approach. You notice Brendan doesn't use the word intermediate scrutiny, doesn't say that. Right? He doesn't have to. This is a middle tier approach. While I would not endorse that characterization and would not welcome a further subdividing of equal protection analysis, candor compels the recognition 
that this relatively differential rational basis standard takes on a sharper focus when we have a gender-based classification, so much is clear. So Brennan never actually says quasi-suspect here. He doesn't say intermediate. He doesn't have to. Everyone knows what he's doing. And that's why he was so effective. And then the concurring opinion comes and says, here's what we're actually doing. And then later on, they like, oh yeah, middle tier, intermediate. Everyone with me so far? Justice Stevens' is concurring opinion, again, this is probably where we're famous concurring opinion. Where is it? I can't pass it. Here it is. It's only a paragraph or two, right? Justice Stevens argues that there is no scrutiny, right? There is no tier. There's one 14th Amendment. And let me make this point a little bit more bluntly. If we go to the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, it doesn't speak of race, doesn't speak of gender, just says persons. That persons cannot be denied equal protection. And Stephen says that means we have to review all classifications at an equal level. Okay, so there's a problem with that one, right? You'll see this in Cleburne. What if the government treats men differently than women? What if they treat rich people different from poor? Is everything given strict scrutiny? Is everything given like a rational basis review? And if you have a single standard, how do you judge different types of treatment? Okay. Then you have Justice Rehnquist's dissent. And, and there were there's not many dissents here, but Rehnquist dissented. Um, he actually argued, uh, Ava, what, what did Rehnquist argue in his dissent? Um, Let me ask you this question, Ava, right? Does Justice Rehnquist think it's appropriate that a, a man is bringing this lawsuit and complaining about how he's being treated unfairly? No. Why not? Why does, why does Justice Rehnquist not feel this case, right? Why, why, why is he kind of not happy with this? Does, does Justice Rehnquist think the men are being oppressed here? Who does he think is actually getting the benefit? Who's, who's benefiting in this case? Who, who, who has the ups, upshot in this case, right, with this Oklahoma law? Women. So this is Stephanie's point from a couple minutes ago, right? Rehnquist is like, this law only applies to burdens, not, not the benefits. Oklahoma here gave a benefit to women, they can do that. It's not about burdening men, that men get at 18. Whereas, I'm sorry, men get it at 21, whereas females get it at 18. Okay? This actually, if you want to compare it, remember Justice Holmes' draft dissent in Buchanan versus Warley, right? Remember you had a white guy trying to buy a house from the, 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 the black homeowner, and, and Holmes was like, wait a minute, the 14th Amendment's not meant to help white people, what are we, this is nuts, right? There are shades of that in Rehnquist's dissent. He's like, this is not about helping men, it's about helping women. He's trying to call BS on Ginsburg litigation strategy that you're having all these poor men who don't get their housing allowances, right? It's like, that's not what this is about. Uh, but that's exactly why Ginsburg brought the case that she did. Um, Rehnquist, I don't think, was on the court when Reed or Craig was decided. He joined, I think, in check right, 74, I think. So he would come on the court by the time um, Craig came on. Yeah, he, he joined the court, I think, in 74. Reed was 72, and Frontier, I think, was 73. So I think he was not yet on the court. Just checking that. Yeah, yeah, Kenny. I don't know. I mean, this is just kind of like right? Were there any original, originalist arguments back then about oh, you know, this person, they meant male only, and that females weren't? So, well, that argument is not entirely correct. I was being a little bit glib. So if we go to... Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, um, it speaks of males, right? It said if the right to vote is denied to any male inhabitants of such state. So Section 2 does speak of men. Um, Justices Ginsburg and Scalia would often have this debate where Scalia would say that under the original meaning of the Constitution, uh, they were concerned about race and not gender. And then Ginsburg would come back and say, well, it says persons, not men. And then Scalia would say, well, look, in Section 2 it says men. So there's no answer to this debate, but, but this is ongoing. Very good question. 
Uh, but the notion of originalism, as the label is used today, didn't really have that uh, existence in the 70s. It wasn't until the early 80s that, that term even came around. There were originalists in the court, going back to Justice Black and even before that, but that phrase didn't really have the resonance it does today. Ah, you're funny. Yeah. No, yeah, it came around a little bit later. Trey? Oh, you're funny. Yeah. So, I mean, the liquor store now just doubled their clientele of like kids buying beer. Whoa, oh, actually, uh, Trey, I'm taking it back. No. After this law, what do you think happened? Did Oklahoma drop the drinking age for men, or did they raise it for women? So everyone got screwed, right? <laughs> no one bought beer. Liquor stores lost out. This is actually um, one of the odd aspects of equal protection, right? Let's say the government says they're being treated unequally. What do you do? Do you bring it down, or do you raise it up, screwing everyone? And I'm pretty sure, just checking this, I think afterwards they raised the drinking age to 21 uh, 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 as, a, as a matter of course. So now no one can buy this cheap beer. So, you know, who won here? I don't know. The Baptists? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Bootleggers not happy either. The bootleggers are probably really happy. Are there questions on Craig or Frontiera? Okay. All right, let's move on. Um, so throughout the 1980s, there was an ongoing discussion of where exactly um, the tiers of scrutiny were. Because um, there was always these cases, like we did, you have a um, Cleburne, which came actually before VMI. So you can see this time, they were still arguing about these scrutiny tiers. But let's jump ahead to the 1990s, right, with the United States versus uh, a Virginia case. Um, this case concerned the Virginia Military um, Institute. I'm sorry? I remember this. Oh, remember this case? Yeah. yeah, it was a big case at the time. Uh, this case involved the Virginia Military Institute. And here's a photograph of them. Um, it's a public institution. Uh, and for 100 some odd years, uh, it was single means only men were admitted. Um, I think this picture is in your book now, the, the first female cadets. Um, right, so this is Justice Ginsburg. She is often called the notorious RBG. She, she loves this story. I think it, this went to her head about three or four years ago. I think it's, it's, it, it, it's sad at this point. But she often says that both she and the notorious B.I.G. are from Brooklyn. So they share a lot, a lot in common. If you come to my office, I have a copy of her high school yearbook. And you can see her, her humble abodes in, uh, in Brooklyn. Um, I put this book in your, I put this picture in your books. I love it. Um, even though Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg um, could not disagree more on basically everything, um, they were they were very very good friends. And I love this picture, which was in their office, of Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg riding an elephant together in India. Uh, and they would go on all these trips. They they had a love of opera. And the reason why I like to focus on this is it shows that you can like a person that you disagree with. Um, far too often today, uh, people who disagree uh, are hating each other as human beings. I think that's very, uh, very unfortunate. I'm actually grateful this class is very open-minded. People have lots of different views. We get along, so I can tell, get along pretty well. Uh, at least in here, don't misbehave, which is mostly what I care about. Uh, but there's no one shouting, no one saying, you can't say that, and you can't say that. So we have good, we have a good, um, uh, we, have, we have a good rapport here. Uh, but this is one of those cases where Scalia and Ginsburg were really at odds. They were really at odds. And there's this funny story Ginsburg always tells. She says that um, the, the usual courses, a majority opinion circulated, and then the dissent circulated to everyone else. But Scalia did her a favor. He sent his dissent just to her so she could fix some stuff. Because she made some mistakes. Or at least Scalia said there were mistakes. And that way, it would uh, uh, avoid Ginsburg the, the scorn of Nino. And there was one error which they fought over. Ginsburg refers to the Charlottesville, campo, uh, sorry, the Charlottesville campus of the University of Virginia. There's no such thing. as only one UVA. There's no Charlottesville campus. And so Scalia would always rip her on that one. But uh, they, they tried to help each other out. And Ginsburg would always say that when I would read a Scalia dissent and modify my opinion, it made it stronger. Right, because if you have someone who really rips your stuff apart, you become saying, "Oh crap, I have to address this." And, oh, here's a good argument exchange. If there's no dissent, we discussed this before. If there's no dissent, the majority opinion can be a little bit lazy. Right, they don't need to tie together all the loose ends. 
But when you have a Scalia dissent nipping on your heels, you better have your act together. And I can say with certainty that the Ginsburg opinion is much stronger because she responded and engaged the Scalia dissent. In contrast, Justice Kennedy never acknowledges the census. He's it's beneath him, right? This, this, of all the Kennedy things that strikes me as bonkers, he just never acknowledges the census. He just Scalia is like throwing nuclear missiles at him, and like Kennedy's like, no, 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 I don't have to deal with this. I'm not, I'm not listening. I'm not. Listening. <laughs> More than anything else, drives me nuts. But Kennedy just doesn't care. He's got five votes. Doesn't really matter at that point. Anyway, uh, enough of me. All right, um, uh, Gabe. All right, you want to give me the facts, please? Oh, by the way, one more thing. Justice Thomas recused why his son attended VMI. So this is why Scalia was alone in dissent. OK, go ahead, Gabe. Please give me the facts. Okay, very good. Thank you for that, Keith. So the facts were like this, right? You had the school that's been in existence, what, 1839, so over 150 something years, right? We're talking before the Civil War. And their goal was to produce citizen soldiers through the adversative method. Um, and Justice Ginsburg makes a lot of discussion of this adversative method for reason, right? Colby, why does Ginsburg put so much focus on discussing this? Um, this method to create these, right, these citizen soldiers, right? Why does Ginsburg spend so much time discussing this adversative method and why it's important? Because it doesn't really show a significant government interest for, like, for sex-based No, no, I don't, I, I'm, why is this adversative method such an important aspect of this case? You give me the answer to my third question on the road. I'm, I, I'm doing the facts still. Why, why is it so important that the adversative method exists? To prevent discrimination. No, no, no. What's the adversative method? I'm thinking right now on that. I'm sorry. Trey? Uh, the adversative method is the fact that the, the undergraduates, well, they were, the upperclassmen worked hard on the underclassmen, plus the, the entire situation, physical training, uh, pushing to your limits, uh, no, uh, no privacy. And the question was, could, could a woman handle that? And Ginsburg said, this is not a sex issue. Anyone can do this if they want Ah. OK, you hear me again. You hear me two answers on the road. Let me stop right here and, and discuss this point. The school wasn't a walk in the park, right? This is not like you know most colleges, where you go to college and you, know, you can drink beer and eat donuts and do whatever you want and go to take your exams and be done with it, right? This was a very specific program. And it was designed to create what they call citizen soldiers, right? They wanted physical rigor. They lived in Spartan barracks. They wore uniforms. They ate together. They did not have any privacy. I mean, if anybody went through boot camp, when you're in the showers, when you're in the bathrooms, there's, there's, there's no walls, right? Everything's open, right? Because, yeah, people, they're, they're nodding. So this was designed to basically, Brian, do you want to add, like, Break their souls and see what their limits are. Want, or Carlos, I, either one, whoever wants to discuss. That's, that's the point of boot camp. It's supposed to break them down and try to get rid of all the, what we call like bad habits that you have, like as a young citizen, and get rid of them so you can make you the way that the army or whatever branch of service you're in wants you to. So, like, that's the reason behind you know, all the, the tough things that you go through while you're in basic training, just to kind of break it down to a base level so that it can build you up. Yeah, Carlos, do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, the United States, since the 
Uh, very what word? I like that. If you don't work as a team, you're going to die. Okay, Mary, <laughs> thank God we don't have this in this class. We'd be screwed. <laughs> we grade in a curve here, thankfully. <laughs> or maybe not thankfully. Um, so yeah, so I, I, think, I think Brian and Carlos uh, stated the issue well. This is designed to basically destroy people. I would not last five seconds of boot camp. I'd be washed out in five seconds. Wouldn't even, wouldn't even make it past the front door. Uh, but thankfully, we don't have to go. Um, but Virginia argued that because of this adversative method, it's not conducive to co-ed education. They said that if we had women in this program, we couldn't run this institution the way we wanted to. And specifically, the lack of privacy, uh, of showers, uh, of bathrooms. Um, they also suggested that the women perhaps couldn't meet the physical fitness standards, which we, we discussed a little bit earlier with the firefighter example. So they said, we need to have a single sex education. You had a student who was in high school apply, and she, well, she was denied, uh, uh, and then she sued. And then Virginia said, OK, we have an idea, right? We will create a parallel, a sister institution to give women this training, right? So Samuel, what was the problem with the, the Mary Baldwin College, this, this liberal arts college in Virginia? What was the, um, why was that not adequate uh, uh, to remedy uh, the problem? Uh, so the um, remedial order kind of acts as like restitution. It's supposed to put a person in good as position as if they weren't discriminated upon. And um, the, uh, the sister school did not uh, fix that remedy because it was just um, kind of uh, didn't have that adversative program. It was kind of just off school and didn't provide the same uh, educational benefits as EMI did. Very good, very good, very good. Uh, Jonathan, you want to add something? It was, there's, I think she focused on that so much to say that there wasn't three options. There was two. Either you go completely private. We don't have it at all. Or you don't have it at all because we can't make this experience any other way. Uh -huh. So Jonathan says there's not a third option, right? It's either you go hard or you go home. Right? <laughs> you either have this program open to everyone or you don't have it at all. So this raises a question, right? Kendall, what exactly is the state's interest here in having VMI. Why does the state have this institution at all? Why, I mean, this is, this is basically the second aspect of Jonathan's point, right? Why, do you, why does the state need to train citizen soldiers? No, my, my question is a little bit different. My question is this, Kendall. Why does Virginia need to breed citizen soldiers? Why, why is it even a state interest that's worth having? Well, we can fight another civil war? I mean, what? what, what? Uh, yeah, Jonathan? I was saying, isn't it a trophy, like a badge of honor? Like, all of our senators go here. All these big people went here. This is the bragging rights for them. So, so your second point, right? Is this an important governmental interest? Scalia, I think, gets this thing. Well, it's not for us to decide if this is important. This has been here for 100-something years. It's an important institution for the state. But Ginsburg, I think, her response is, if you guys can't do this in an equal fashion, don't do it at all. Now, you've seen this argument before. Let's see if I can connect it. Where have you seen this argument made before? Last, what? Fisher. Fisher? Who said it? Who said this in Fisher? Which opinion? No, 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 no. There's a very specific person who said this in another case you read last week. Good. Who said it? Um, I mean, the justice? Yeah, which justice said that? You, you, once I say it, you remember it immediately. Scalia. No, it wasn't Scalia. Mm -hmm. 
who said that if you can't <clears throat> that if you can't have this elite institution with equality, you shouldn't have it at all? Who said that? Someone said it. What did Thomas say? Do you remember? It is Thomas. That's right. What did Thomas say about Michigan's law school? Oh, now it's coming back. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Bingo, John, right? Thomas said Michigan wanted to have it both ways, right? They wanted to have an elite law school with this sort of racial preference, right? If Michigan wanted to have a law school, you should not have this admission policy. In other words, go hard or go home, right? If you want to have an if you want to have equal protection laws, it means you admit people without regard to this racial preference. So it's basically the flip side to this, right? Does Virginia even have an interest in holding this institution? Um, Ginsburg says not really. Then in Michigan, Thomas says, you guys don't have an interest in having an elite institution, right? You can have a law school that admits more broadly, but you'll lose your US News ranking, right? You'll, you'll drop in the ranking. Uh, so the question of what's a compelling interest, right? In Grutter, the court held that the benefits of diversity is compelling. But I think what Ginsburg basically says here is having a citizen soldier school is not even important, right? Because you don't need this. You're not, you know, you're not waging another civil war and you don't need your your, I mean, that's why school exists, right? To, to have their people ready to join the join the fight against the, the war. Sam? Is there a difference between saying that only allowing men in is not related to making citizens soldiers, or is she saying that having citizens soldiers? Well, well, there's two aspects, right? I'm talking right now about the end, right? What's the government's goal? She says this isn't important at all, right? But if you do think it's important, you have to have it consistent with equal protection, right? Understand what they just said? Yes, okay. but I'm just asking, is, is there a way you could interpret it as saying that like both ways, that like it's not related and it's a question of if there's even It's both, yeah. She said, Ginsburg, it fails both aspects, right? She says they don't have a good fit and it's not important. I think she will say it fails both aspects. Everyone with me so far. But let's now go on to the part of Ginsburg's opinion. Raven, why does Ginsburg's opinion think that this, um, uh, all male institution is not substantially su I can never say that word substantially related to the governance interest. Why, why does Ginsburg think the fit is there lacking? Um, well, I have a lot of like okay. All right, Raven. Again, what's the school's justification for why they need to have a single sex program? Answer that question, please. They said that it's important because if they were to admit women, then they would have to change their program. Ah, okay, good. So Malia, does Ginsburg find that this justification is adequate? No. Okay, good, why not? Good, 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 good. Okay, I like the way you phrased that. There may be some ways to do it differently. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay, good. I like the way you phrased that. So Ginsburg gives this phrase, right, which is important. She says, is the justification exceedingly persuasive? All right? Is the justification exceedingly persuasive? In my mind, and you guys can disagree with me or not, Ginsburg levels up intermediate scrutiny here, right? It's not just a question of whether this will work. It's will it persuasively work, right? Will this, is it persuading me that this is really likely going to happen? In other words, if we allow women in here, is the adversity pro program going to fail? Probably not. And that's enough, right? I, this is a hard concept to explain, but let me walk through this one more time. By saying that the justification must be exceedingly persuasive, it's not enough to persuade you that this will happen. It's basically saying it must happen, right? She's blurring here the intermediate scrutiny with the strict scrutiny. This is Scalia's point in dissent. There's not much of a, there's not much daylight here between what strict scrutiny requires and what intermediate requires. That you basically have to persuade me, not a preponderance, but almost beyond a reasonable doubt, that this will fail, right? That 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 this program will not work. 
And because you can't persuade me, as it's not me, but Justice Ginsburg, this is unconstitutional, right? These are the two most important words in the entire opinion, exceedingly persuasive. That the state now has the burden to persuade the court that their method will fail unless they admit only men. Laura? So the exceedingly persuasive standard, that's more for, um, like, after the, the government like, has a burden of proof or after they try to show? That is the burden. The burden is to be exceedingly persuasive. Not just persuasive, but exceedingly. So the, the law itself, like on its face, doesn't have to be exceedingly persuasive. It's not the law, it's the justification, right? What is the government's reason for doing this? Because we don't have this single sex program, our adversative method will fail. And Ginsburg says, well, that might be the case, but you haven't persuaded me. And you have to not just persuade her, but it's, it's persuade her, it's, it, it's, it's excessively persuading her, right? Very persuasive. Sam? I was just uh, curious if exceedingly persuasive is the standard, or is it just an ad hoc test from this case? That well, uh, I think this is your standard for gender-based discrimination. The court has addressed this issue in a few other cases, but this is your clearest statement. Colby? So did Ginsburg look at other similar programs throughout the country in order for her gender Good, life? good. Well, I'll come back to you. You didn't know the answer before. I'll come to you now. Okay. What have some of the other service academies done? Well, like, even here, just an hour north of A&M with the third largest military organization, they implement, they allowed women into the into the court cadets that have a very similar training program as BMI, and they were extremely successful. And it originally started off as a, as when they brought women in as a single, they were both, uh, not they were not integrated outfits, but they are now integrated outfits, and they still perform on the same level. Um, also West Point, right? West Point and, and then the Naval Academy Good. and the other uh, military academies throughout the... Right, so th this I think factors into the court's opinion. It's saying if these other schools can do it, why can't VMI, right? You haven't persuaded me exceedingly that you this is the only way of doing it. John, is it a hand or, or, or reach? Trey? Yeah, it seemed they, they they did it pretty quick, didn't they? So may, may, maybe the justification wasn't as urgent as they said it was. Yeah, I think within a couple of years they had cadets graduating that were female. I don't know how many. I, I had this picture of these two, but I don't know the, the number. What? In that picture, because everyone around those girls has such a weird face, like some crazy thing. I wish I knew. I don't. I know the answer. I have no idea. It's a good picture. I like it. It's a good picture. Yeah. Yeah, we, I remember we had to, I had to buy this from some Virginia newspaper for the case book at the track of the royalty. These things are pain in the neck to get legal. It's actually not easy. Yeah, Brian. How, how would VMI maintain like, a single gender class? Like, 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 no one sued. Yeah, I think that's the answer. Someone sued. Oh, what a good question, right? So private institutions are not subject to the 14th Amendment, right? So you can't bring a constitutional challenge. Private institutions are subject to federal funding requirements. And there are certain constraints on uh, sex-segregated schooling. Uh, but as a general matter, you can still have single-sex institutions uh, under federal law. Um, state institutions have exceptions for religious schools um, but they might not have exceptions for non-religious private schools. So to, to answer your question in a roundabout way, I think a state could probably prohibit a um, non-religious sex related school, but, but they don't, as a matter of course. Abdul and then Sam? This relates to the question of what will church or synagogues more specific <clears throat> be forced to allow for same-sex marriage. Oh, you knew I was going there, didn't you? Yeah, so Abdul's question is this, right? Houses of worship that do not, Trace nodding his head vigorously, uh, houses of worship that do not perform same-sex marriages. Um, could the state require a priest or a chaplain or a minister to perform a same-sex marriage? I think the answer is no under probably the uh, free exercise clause. A better question, 
Could a local jurisdiction remove a sales tax exemption for house of worship if they don't perform same-sex weddings? I think we'll see that in our lifetimes. I think, I think we'll... We're already seeing part of it uh, by clergy helping with taxes, but it's already coming to fruition. We knew it was coming. Well, I'm sorry, Trey, what, I, what, 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 what exemption are you talking about? Uh, housing allowances and housing for clergy are considered exempt. All right. But we're seeing that, uh, and, and it, there's no logical reason it shouldn't be, uh, but we're seeing that challenge now partially because of the fact that some clergy and some denominations have grown uh, don't allow uh, same-sex unions. Uh, and what, what states are doing this? No judgment, though, right? Turn the other cheek, right? Right, so we'll see this. So I don't think of a straight-up law mandating that uh, uh, priests and rabbis and imams officiate at a, at a, at a same-sex union. I do think you'll have jurisdictions try to rescind tax exemptions, and that is extremely powerful because priests don't make much money. Their allowances are not very high, right? And if your stuff now is getting taxed at the marginal tax rate, um, it might make it very hard for you to uh, to minister to your flock and to your fellow classmates. Yeah. Oh, this is your plan B, right? Okay. Well, you'll be in a different tax bracket, my friend. Yeah. Who's that? All right, whatever. Um, all right. So, other questions on so Ginsburg's opinion, VMI. That's a, that's a hell of a ringtone you got there. <laughs> Thank you. So any other questions on Ginsburg's opinion, VMI? All right, let's go to the Scalia dissent. Uh, Herbierto, get, what, what Scalia is, and he's very pissed here. I mean, sometimes he's more angry than others. He's really pissed here. Um, he's not always angry. In some opinions, he's, he's, you know, like the stages of loss, like you have grieving and you know, eventually you accept it. Scalia goes through the stages. He's, he's not happy. So Herbierto, what's, what's Scalia's uh, argument here? Uh, Scalia's saying basically that these are wrong tests. Yeah, these are wrong tests. Is he wrong? Is he wrong? In other words, is, is he wrong that what the court did here is different than what had been done before? It pains you to say, but yeah. So I think he's correct in saying that the court here is applying a more rigorous test than before. Is that is that, that much as fair, Herbierto? Yes, he, he's applying a more rigorous test. Than, the text looks like it should have been a less rigorous test than before. Yeah. Does he believe in intermediate scrutiny at all as, as a thing? No, no, he would go back to the two tiers. This is Laura's question before that, unless it's race, you go back to rational uh, rational basis review. Um, he also writes at some length that this is uh, actually single sex gender education is beneficial to both sexes and that it may actually help places. He He's concerned, and this is perhaps Trey's instinct, that you'll have these private Catholics and we shut down for not allowing you know boys and girls to be together. And this is probably what he's seeing down uh, the road. But even if you have this for primary schools, for VMI, says it's not my place to second guess how they structure this adversative method. I saw a hand somewhere. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah go ahead. Okay. Yeah, this is about important governmental interests. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he actually thinks that having a citizen soldier breed of citizen soldiers is something that is important, that is an important state interest. Ginsburg does not. Um, he also worries that this will open the floodgates of litigation concerning single gender education as well. Quit. I was just curious because his argument was that uh, the benefits that uh, segregating would give on education, it, and it was also the military institute's argument, it kind of echoes that argument in Brown that like, racial segregation does provide benefits as well. And I'm just curious, like, how he reconciles that. Or... Oh, so you're saying that the idea of having um, sex segregate education is similar to having racial segregated education. Is that what you're yeah, getting? I mean, some of the arguments were saying, well, racial you know, purity is beneficial because we need to keep the uh, peace and everything. And so, saying... yeah. So, I mean, there, there are, where's my psychologist, right? <laughs> There are some studies, and I don't vouch for anything in this class, that suggest that in certain contexts, men and women might learn 
better in different circumstances? Robin, mean, please rescue me. Is there, is there something on this? Yeah, there's definitely research on that. Um, okay. You just tailor your teaching method to the gender. But um, no, I'm saying straight up separate classes altogether. Yeah, yeah there's research. Anyone else want to add something? I'm out, I'm out, I'm out of my league here. Yeah, yeah, Gabe. How was that? It was awesome. It was awesome, okay. <laughs> so this, again, this is the case where I think sec, um, intermediate scrutiny and strict scrutiny are different, right? If you had a school only for people with certain but a school for people who are just men and women, well, Arlene, okay, maybe that might work. So that, that, that might be an instance where the different standards make sense. Yeah, Raquel? What do you think? I don't think it would be, but I think at the same time, it's so unsure that men So, well, well, let me answer your question this, Raquel. If the women at Mary Baldwin could handle the exact same physical fitness standards, why do they need to go to a separate institution, right? If they're able to meet the same levels, why must have one school? So it almost would prove the point, right? You have two exactly identical programs, different institutions. Why do you need that? That makes sense. Uh, Sam. Okay, you're stretching. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you guys are stretching. Okay, fine. Yeah, Laura. So for these these tiers of scrutiny, um, let's say like the time and energy lab, exceedingly persuasive, of course, goes under. Um, it's in between intermediate scrutiny and strict scrutiny. So because the first question is, you know, what what classification. I think I, let me. I think the exceedingly persuasive is intermediate scrutiny now. That Ginsburg modified the standard, and that's your new intermediate okay. scrutiny. So it's not like level three point five. I don't know where I am, right? I think that that's your that that's your second tier. So as like circumstances change, how would we kind of like approach that? I think it would still be yeah. within these three general. Um, yeah. Wait, wait till we get to Justice Kennedy next week. You're gonna hate me, right? When we get to sexual orientation stuff, it just it becomes a mess. I know what you're trying to do, and it's very respectably trying to reconcile these tiers, but they crumble very quickly. Well, these tiers, wouldn't they be considered, like, living? It just because, like, things change? Sure. That's a good way. Yeah, they're alive. They would still apply. They're still available. It's like the, the, the tide, right? The tide rolls and rolls out. I'm not exactly sure where it is at any given time. Yeah, I, I, I sense your frustration. I'm trying not to be false hope, but... You can understand the intermediate scrutiny standards that have this successfully, not successfully, exceedingly persuasive standard baked into it. Yeah. I do have a question. Good. So, like, if near the end of it, he, he points out, Scalia points out um, that, like, it's going to have a, in the future, it's going to have a big implica or implication on private same sex education or just like private institutions in general because of the amount of money they get from federal government? Yeah, this is my answer from Malia a minute ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but what I'm saying is what he says not including financial aid, if it ever got to that point where they were trying to say like you have to uh, integrate or whatever because of financial aid, did that like come up with like a different uh, problem like Yes. Yeah. So I mean, you have a college like Hillsdale, which doesn't accept any federal money, and they're not subject to any mandates. Virtually every other college in the country accepts federal money. So let me give you a hypothetical. What if a religious college offers housing to married couples if they're husband and wife? But if it's a husband and husband, they won't give them married housing. Then the student who's given financial aid can't use it at this institution. And at the oral argument in the Burgerful, the same-sex marriage case, I think it was either Justice Alito or Robert, I can't remember, asked the Solicitor General, what if a school doesn't want to give housing to uh, same-sex couples? Will it lose its federal funding? And the uh, Solicitor General said, that's going to be an issue. Yeah, we'll get there. There was no answer. The answer, of course, is of course to lose their funding. All right, let's look at the last case. Cleburne versus Cleburne Living Center. This case doesn't really fit in anywhere, and I don't even know if I should even teach anymore, but I'll at least teach it this year. Um, I'm on the, I'm a, I would cut it, but Randy wants to keep it, so we'll, we'll leave it. Um, 
we have these three tiers, right? We have intermediate, we have strict, and then you have below that rational basis. But what about that gap between rational basis and intermediate, right? Is there another tier? Cleburne, and a case comes after it called a, 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 a Romer, we'll do that next week, um, suggests that there might be some room for what's called heightened rational basis review, right? So, I mean, let's, let's try and map this out, right? So we have strict scrutiny. You have intermediate scrutiny, which as modified now means exceedingly persuasive, right? Then you have rational basis scrutiny. And then maybe we have this, and I'll call this one three, two, one, and maybe, you know, like maybe 1.5, which you know, might be called like, you know, heightened rational basis review. Um, as you can tell, I think Laura said they're living, yeah, they're like zombies, right? They, they're undead. Uh, they're always changing. The court doesn't apply them consistently. But for years, there was a discussion, well, is there something between rational basis and heightened rational basis? Yeah. Is there something in the middle? Cleveland gets there. So, who am I up to? Kelly, what were the facts in um, Cleburne, please? Okay. What was the Cleveland Living Center? Yeah, right. So it was a group home for mentally handicapped individuals, okay? Um, you'll do zoning in property too, but you'll learn quickly of a phrase called NIMBY. You know this phrase, NIMBY? Not in my backyard. Very good. Not in my backyard. The defining feature of local land use is keeping out people who are different than me. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's local land use in a, in a nutshell. Um, so generally, if you apply for a zoning permit and you're denied, the answer is too damn bad. The government has almost virtually unlimited discretion to regulate the use of property. Um, one of the only restraints on zoning is the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment. That is, if you restrict, let's say, people from living together uh, based on their family status, or restrict them from living together based on uh, uh, race, right? That could be a violation of the Constitution. But this wasn't a racial classification. They were denying the building permit here, I'm sorry, the zoning permit here, because of the fact that mentally handicapped people will be living here. Are people mentally handicapped a suspect classification? No, they are not. Are they a quasi-suspect classification? They're not. So there was called a non-suspect classification. So you think, okay, if it's a non-suspect classification, you go down to the, le the level, the bottom rung, which is a rational basis review. But Cleburne is significant because the court didn't apply what we traditionally think of as rational basis review. They did something very different, right? Elena, what did, what did the court do here that was a little bit inconsistent with rational basis review? Well, do they say those intermediate scrutiny? Did the court say that? No, so what, what, what did the court do? What burden? Or let me ask this question, right? Who had the burden here to deny the permit? Zach, was a burden on the Cleburne home? Important point Elena just said. With rational basis review, usually the burden is on the person asserting the right. That is the home. Here they put the burden on the government. And Min, what was the government's rationale of why this permit was denied? Ah, so they were asking, why do you have this law, right? Now, the government said we need this to promote safety, right? These people in the community, they might commit crimes, they might create vagrancy, et cetera. But why don't you exclude sorority houses? Min makes that point. In other words, the court's basically second-guessing whether this will actually serve their goal. Their end is community safety, and their means is to deny this permit to this type of home. Might it serve that goal? Yeah, it might, it might not. Will it serve that goal? 
Now, what's the difference? Might it versus will it? Will it serve that goal? Probably not. So here, the court puts a more exacting level of scrutiny on the denial, the denial of the permit. Even though under rational basis review, you don't go that far. The, per, the burden is on the plaintiff. The plaintiff here lost. But here, because they give a stricter scrutiny, the plaintiff prevails. The home prevails because they can show that these are not the real reasons why, right? What's the real reason why, Fernando, the government denied this permit, according to the court? Um, I think they have like four All right, give me a couple of them. But what's, what do you think the real reason is they denied this permit? They just didn't want to other houses. Well, not just other houses. Schools and stuff around, they don't want to be. What, what exactly were they trying to exclude here? That's uh, mentally burned to be around. Like, right. They, they, were, they, were, they were excluding people like, who were mentally handicapped. Right? That's what they were trying to exclude. Um, again, this seems a lot like intermediate scrutiny. It was based on a stereotype that having people with mental handicaps in a community will create crime and violence and, and, and vagrancy and everything else. Um, if this looks a lot like the opinion in Frontiero and Craig B. Bourne, uh, you're right, because it's basically applying an intermediate scrutiny. The majority denies it. Now, the important question, Kenny, is why won't the majority just come out and say we're going to make mentally handicapped people a, sus a quasi suspect class? and give them intermediate scrutiny. Why doesn't the court say that? That's the important question for you to answer. Why would they just come out and say this straight up? I think because they think they don't have their best interests in mind for themselves and that the No, no, no. my question is why won't the court go out and declare a new suspect classification or a new quasi-suspect classification? That's my question. Why? Why don't they want to expand it? One second. Yeah, McKinney? I don't know if this is the correct answer or not, but was it because they said there's like different uh, degrees of mental, mental handicap? So like they said some of it is very obvious, some of it they can get by just by how do you, How would a court define it, right? Yeah. Race, you can say black or white, you know, gender, male or female, maybe not anymore, I don't know, right? But there are different degrees of mental handicap. Jonathan? I was just going to say, say similar floodgates. Like, okay, Flood we're going to add in mental handicap. What's next? This thing's already so convoluted, we can't even figure out one, two, three. Now we've got one, two, three, one point five, another class. It just seems endless. Yeah. I think anyone else want to add something? I think, I think they both make very strong points. The court is hesitant to go beyond race and gender because it gets really messy and complicated. Right? It gets very messy and complicated. So instead they say, well, this is just a non-suspect class, but the rational basis review they're applying here doesn't look like rational basis review. And there's just one line where they say, you know, this law was motivated by a bare desire to harm. In a case called Moreno, this law is motivated by a bare desire to harm. And what they say is, if this law is designed to harm one group of people, that is not a rational basis. Right? If the only reason why this, this regime exists is to harm someone, that's not a rational basis. I don't know that that's correct. That was a Justice Brennan opinion. But Justice Kennedy will cite that over and over again. So keep attention to that case, Moreno, that a bare desire to harm. Yeah, Brian? The, the, the invidious is a phrase often used for race or gender. They don't use that phrase so much here, but they say it's a bare desire to harm some group. Justices Marshall, Brennan, and Blackman say, let's be honest here, right? This is intermediate screening. This is not rational basis. Let, 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 let's, let's be candid what we're doing. They say the refusal to acknowledge that something more than minimum rationality review is at work here is, in my view, unfortunate. And they actually cite Lochner, right? They say that rational basis permits this kind of searching inquiry, brings us back to the Lochner. We should never have Lochner. Lochner is bad, okay? Right? So they reject that. So questions on Cleburne. All right, let me try to um, synthesize this for you a bit and get you ready for 
our class on Tuesday. Well, actually, on Tuesday, we go back to substance of due process, but we'll come back to equal protection later. But at least throughout the 1970s and 80s, had a settled framework that if you have a suspect classification, which is basically race or nationality, you would give it a very rigorous review. Uh, with a quasi-suspect classification like gender, you give it this intermediate scrutiny, although later that will be expanded to require an exceedingly persuasive justification. Um, what's different between strict scrutiny and intermediate scrutiny? Um, not much, maybe except bathrooms, and that might not be a real one anymore. Um, then you have the rational basis review, right, where you have uh, 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 basically a non-suspect classification. Anything goes. As it stands today, uh, rational basis review means the government is going to win. So instead, they carve out this little 1.5 regime, what they might call heightened rational basis review or rational basis with bite, which gives a little oomph to the review and critically puts the burden on the government. And when the burden's on the government, the government will usually lose. Okay. Questions? Yes, Sam? Is heightened rational basis review kind of like uh, deferential Scrutiny? Oh, like... God, stop making new labels. Uh, it, it doesn't exist, right? It's, it's not a, the court never acknowledged that's what it was doing, but if you read the Brennan and Marshall Blackman dissent, that's what they suggest going on. But yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing called heightened rational based review. It's not a thing, but that's what they do. Anything else? No? All right, I'll see some of you Saturday morning. Thank you very much.